Welcome to Scholar Spite, a talk show with researchers. I'm your host, Amrita Panjwani, founder of Simplified Statistics. And today on this talk show, we have a very special guest whom I know from my school days. She pursued her research from Washington University in the area of genomics. And I would like to describe her in three Bs. Brilliant, born to travel, and beautiful. A warm welcome to my friend, Dr. Jasreet Hundal. Hi, Amrita. Wow, that was that was quite a flattering introduction. And, you know, thank you so much for inviting me to your show. I know it's been a long time, uh, you know, since we've known each other. And it is my honor to be on your show. Thank you. Likewise. And I would like to still give a brief introduction about yourself. Uh, so I came to the U.S. Uh, for my master's. I did my master's in bioinformatics uh, from Georgia Tech in Atlanta. My bachelor's was a B.Tech in biotech from India. Uh, and I wanted, you know, a more, um, you know, I liked IT. I liked bio. So I wanted to pursue a field which is like a blend of both. And bioinformatics seemed like the right choice uh, then. So I just, you know, took that up uh, for my master's. After that, I joined uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I was working as one of their bioinformatics investigator in a very cutting edge group. Uh, it was called Technology Development. Um, I worked at the Genome Institute, which was at that time, you know, sort of sequencing the first cancer genome in the world. Um, so basically in sequencing, what you do is you sort of, like everybody is made up of, you know, um, different, Sort of alphabets as you would call it basically it's the different combination of the dna and um you know in cancer genomes there could be different mutations that set us up uh, for cancer and you know as part of sequencing you find out what actually each person is made up of like what are those building blocks or the alphabets that make up that particular person so uh, that's what the main focus of my job was, was to figure out, you know, all of these different cancer genomes. And we used to get a lot of like patient samples and stuff like that. And I learned a lot of that technology, just analyzing those patient samples. Uh, during that, I was also, you know, introduced to the world of immunotherapy, uh, which is using your immune system to fight cancer. And you know how the you know that would uh, sort of blend in with genomics, uh, which was the study of the human genome. So um, then there's this new area called immunogenomics, which is sort of like the marriage of um, you know immunotherapy and genomics. Uh, so I decided to pursue my PhD in that. But it was after a couple of years of working at the Genome Institute that I decided that, you know, I find this field interesting. Why not get a degree out of it uh, since I'm doing a lot of that research? So I decided to do my PhD in that. And I graduated a couple of years later. Uh, and then now I'm working, uh, sort of managing all the clinical trials in these uh, immunotherapy-based regimens, um, cancer vaccine trials at WashU. I'm sort of like leading that and managing the analysis side of things. Okay, that sounds that's like really a little interesting. Bit, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's just basically a brief overview of what I do, like a summary of 10 years of, you know, what I've done. So it's, uh, you know, just, just a little bit of an overview. It sounds a lot of learning, I would say. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So since you did your research in USA, how difficult or easy was it for you? Uh, so uh, it would definitely be a combination of both. Um, I think there are like, you know, a lot of cutting edge research that's happening and specifically in the field that I mentioned, you know, I am uh, working on like personalized cancer vaccines and there are like only a few groups around the world that are actually going and vaccinating and, you know, have access to say, a research institute with a hospital so obviously like that's like the easy part i would say because you know you get access to so many resources there are like so many um you know everybody is a big name uh, in the field and you know you get to work with all of them but then it's obviously not easy uh being because i came here as an international student there are challenges associated with that challenges associated with visa uh you know and then Obviously, there are high expectations and standards that are, you know, uh, you know, look 
uh, sort of like expected out of you because you are an international student. You're trying to prove something that, you know, you've left your country, you've come here and there's like a lot of pressure to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely uh, not easy. And then, you know, once you have your PhD, you need to sort of like balance everything um, versus India. I mean, I'm sure everybody has those challenges anywhere in the world, you know, it's just hmm. a different set of challenges in US versus hmm. in India. Uh, we might have like access to all the technology, but then, you know, we have to do like, uh, I mean, everything ourselves, you know, sort of a way there's no like say household help or, you know, small things add up, you know, it's, it's like the everyday as an international student, I would say there are like so many other challenges that we face. Um, but yeah, I mean, in a PhD, a struggle is always there, um, you know, wherever you are in the world. So just that the struggle would be a little different. And I know a lot of people think, wow, it's so easy, you know, to get a PhD in the US. It's not. PhD is never easy. And uh, what would be your take on work-life balance here? So yeah, so um, I mean, I am definitely, I would say, one of those who advocate for that, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I see a lot of people in academia and research who are sort of giving all of their selves to this, you know, to research, to academia, but then there's a, a quick burnout. Um, I totally advocate uh, for maintaining your mental health and work-life balance. Uh, you know, I, I feel that as a researcher, um, you can't even like, you know, sort of think uh, if your mind is like just constantly uh, bogged down by, you know, the same questions every day, like sometimes you just need to get out, get some space, get some air and, you know, like free yourself of these questions to come up with new novel ideas. And, um, you know, I've tried to do that. I love to mm -hmm. travel. Um, during my PhD itself, I traveled to like 35 so countries uh, and every single time like I did that, I felt so much refreshed, um, you know, and rejuvenated and like my mental, like it's, it's just what I needed. I knew for my mental sanity more than anything else, like, you know, um, because while I was growing up uh, with my parents, I traveled a lot and that just sort of built into my personality. And that's the way that I try and, you know, get away from you know, whatever's like bringing me down. That's my way of sort of freeing myself. And I feel like that was my outlet. Somebody else's outlet could just be, you know, like running five miles a day or, you know, just uh, going and, you know, camping or biking or something like that. But basically my point is that you need to take out that time for yourself to maintain that sanity as a researcher. Do not let the pressures of research and uh, academia bog you down um that's that's just a personal choice i made i'm sure there were like a lot of things i might have to like you know let go along the way and i'm okay with that you know it's not mm -hmm. always about uh how many publications you have or you know how much money you make i think um you know the holistic development of an individual is what i would strongly advocate for having been in the research environment for so long that's such a wonderful point you've made here, Jasreet. I really, uh, really find it very inspirational because I see most of the researchers, if you talk about them, their entire uh, time and energy is involved in their research. And right. it is very important for the stability of mental health that you should have your own personal time as well. So very right. good point made here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I, I do see that, you know, there are some researchers who, who will sort of, um, I mean, some PIs who will like maybe look down upon you, like if you're trying to take some time off and, you know, nobody in the lab is taking time off and you're the only one taking time off. And then, you know, I would say you're probably in the wrong place. That's not where you want right. to work. You know, that is not uh, that is not something that will sustain you long term. OK, sure, you'll get, you know, what you're looking for, You'll but you'll burn out. You'll burn out, you know, as after like 10, 20 years of research and you'll, you'll find yourself in a place where you are like, oh, I wish I did more with my life than just, you know, being in the lab 20 hours a day. Um, and, you know, thankfully, the people that I, you know, worked with uh, have always understood um, you know, and they're okay, you know, as long as my work is not uh, being compromised, 
as long as I'm, you know, being productive. I feel I'm more productive when I take time off, exactly, uh, you know, for right. myself, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, um, as I, for that matter, I even had a baby during my PhD and I had to write wow. my research, you know, and there was a paper in revision in nature and, you know, like, there were so many things, but had I not taken that time off for myself, I don't think I would have gotten to the point uh, where I could, you know, sort of have such a high level of research. So that's just my take on it. And, you know, if uh, if somebody would ever like, you know, ask for one thing that they need to do in, uh, you know, graduate school or PhD, I would definitely advocate for that. Uh, so Thank let's you. move to the point where I would say, how do you think your research uh, contributes to a larger community? So I'm, I'm actually very fortunate that I see uh, the sort of impact that my research makes because it's directly uh, related to cancer patients. So just to give you a brief overview, you know, what mm -hmm. I do is sort of like, you know, look at the genome of these cancer patients and trying, trying to figure out what are these things that are setting them apart from, say, a normal person and how we can, uh, you know, uh, use the existing, uh, you know, body's immune system to sort of fight those cells off. Like when you get a cold, you have, you know, these antibodies in your body that sort of fight them off uh, or for any, for the matter, any infection. So oh, why not in cancer? So that's like a large, uh, you know, uh, overview of what my research is. And I feel like, you know, because I'm working in, um, you know, this direct, uh, pay, like analysis to patient uh, sort of like a um, you know role I feel like that's very fortunate because not many people get to do that uh, and that's what I would say is my contribution to the society is that you know I'm trying to sort of uh, you know find what works and what doesn't work um, in in this race to sort of uh, cure cancer as some some people would say. Mm -hmm. So that's a very good point. I think that in your field, you're able to see the contribution directly in front of you and that would add right. to your contentment overall. Exactly. And like that, that was a very, uh, I would say, conscious decision. Uh, mm -hmm. Like bioinformatics is a very wide field. Um, you know, you could do a lot of other things uh, when you have a degree in bioinformatics, but being in cancer genomics, for that matter, even genomics is pretty wide, but being in cancer genomics is something that I wanted to be consciously involved in. I, I know a lot of cancer patients, you know, uh, personally in my family and friends. Uh, so this is a field that is like very near to me. And I, it was a con conscious choice that I made that I want to be associated with something like this. That's wonderful, seriously. So uh, what would be your final uh, message like to the researchers or the aspiring scholars? Is there anything that you would like to tell them or suggest them? A couple of things, you know, I, I would suggest uh, pursue what makes you happy. Uh, you know, you can do something for, you know, for the sake of happiness of the society, for your parents, for your family, for your friends, whatever. Uh, but that's not going to make you happy long term. I always wanted to be you know, somewhere in patient care, you know, um, but growing up, obviously my parents didn't even know like what would be like, you know, uh, the future in say biotech or bioinformatics, but they supported me uh, in whatever I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, and sort of like I carved my own niche wherever I went based on whatever my interests were. So I, I would say, uh, don't be afraid to reach out to people. People are always willing to help you um and but you know you need to take that first step you need to uh you know sort of uh, try and you know make sure that you're reaching out uh look you, looking out like what's going on in the field that you're interested in and you know when i i look back at the time like say seven or eight years back when i was actually like asked okay can you like take a look at uh, this thing called neoantigens, which are sort of like the antigens that we're targeting in the body resulting from cancer. And I didn't even know what that word meant. And, you know, like three years later, I went and did a PhD on it. So, you know, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to ask. And I, and I did say, I said, I don't even know what this means, but you know what? Uh, that's what being a scientist is. Uh, the more you know, the more you don't know. And, you know, and that's okay. Like nobody, uh, you are not supposed to know everything. And because if 
you know everything that there's no point of research it is called research because you're trying to find those answers you're trying to know what you want to know so that would be my like you know one of my major suggestions would be to sort of do what makes you happy and then don't forget like don't be afraid to ask questions don't be afraid to reach out to people um it, if the first person doesn't respond don't worry about it you know that's not how everybody is so please reach out uh and and also like you know try and find what actually you know where your skill set is like what gives you um you know satisfaction as a researcher so like i knew that i was not meant to do um you know long hours bench work um and you know hats off to people who do that uh because my interest was in computers i wanted to do something and that would take my um you know that research interest along with the interest of say cancer and then you know patient care and biotech so i sort of like found that niche for myself and i feel like especially in these sciences there's a lot of unknown and there are like lots of those uh different like small uh, areas of specialization that you can go for but you need to know like what actually you know makes you happy and what actually um you think you are you know um uh, you would be good at uh so that's that's what i would uh that would be my advice and obviously like i mentioned previously uh work life balance uh, so um i'm all for it and i think like we should uh spread more aware- awareness around mm. it uh so definitely look out for your own self nobody else is going to do that that are some really great takeaways it's been very enlightening talking to you today dr jasreet thank you so much thank for you, your Amrita. time today thank you thank you so much and uh, it is definitely my honor to be on your show and thank thanks you. for inviting me